Why? Because you got your face banged over with your shank in your hand. Oh, you. what? You got your face banged over with your shank in your hand. Right there, this is your enemy. Your brother with this skin is not your enemy. Make do of where you're from. Like, not everywhere is meant to be glamorous and all of that. Like, like, I believe my area was how it is for a reason. The beef I've got is man having beef with me, innit? I've got defence mechanism and, and the best form of defence is a Gary Nelson, nicknamed Tyson because of his resemblance to the heavyweight champion Mike Tyson, as well as being very close to and bodyguarding for the Brooklyn boxer. Nelson was the boss of a gang known as Junction Boys, located in Clapham Junction, South London. Junction Boys in modern times go by SUK, which stands for Stick Up Kids, or more recently, 37. You may have come across them through their rappers Score Beasy and Burner. Burner and Nelson share a few similarities. Both absolute units and both were no money makers. Nelson drove flash cars, had the luxury apartment and spent his fortune on designer clothes. The South London career criminal was from Woolwich. In the 1990s, crack cocaine became an established drug in London. The demand for it was through the roof, hence those who supplied it controlled the streets. Nelson would become one of these kingpins who constructed a team full of dealers and shooters who played their part in keeping his kingdom running. Now to keep all these dangerous men in check and following your lead, you simply had to be more intimidating and have a few loose screws yourself. Now on the 20th of October 1993, Nelson along with two friends attempted to enter Brixton Academy, but Danso Williams, being the doorman, refused him entry to the nightclub. Later that night, Nelson along with two friends would approach the house of Danso Williams in Clapham, break in and then fire a hail of bullets at Danso in his hallway, laughing as they left the house. Nelson targeted Danso for disrespecting him. Now it may have been late, but it was rotten luck for them to commit this crime due to the timing. See, police officer Dunn had been investigating a minor domestic dispute, heard gunshot from Danso's house and went to investigate. As the unarmed police officer stepped into the street, Nelson spotted him and immediately shot him in the chest. It instantly killed him. Nelson and his buddies then laughed as they strolled away while a celebratory bullet was fired into the air. Gang members usually enforce their violent antics on each other as well as innocent members of the public. But when it comes to police, they almost always seem to know their place and run. So it takes a special type of nutter to see taking one out as a solution. A post-mortem found PC Dunn died of a gunshot wound to the chest which damaged his lung and aorta. Other officers found Mr. Danso still alive in his doorway. He had trouble breathing before treatment from ambulance officers. He sadly died at 10.05 p.m. from a gunshot wound to the abdomen which severed artery supply in the intestine. Nelson was charged with the murders five weeks after they took place. However, the case was dropped because of insufficient evidence. Now here's where things get interesting. See the 9mm pistol that was used to murder both men. Well, they were supplied by Bryn Mawr Lindock, who was an armed robber turned high-level informant. In truth, many of London's best villains have at one point or another been informants. The motivation for grasping among them money, getting rid of competition, settling scores, corrupting police officers and avoiding prison time are often somewhere in the mix. Now here's the sick part, rather than pursue the informant, Scotland Yard helped him get a soft sentence when he was caught in possession of enough arms to equip a small army. The police wanted everyone to know it cared and wouldn't forget, but the police didn't care enough to act on his own intelligence that a gangland informant working with a corrupt ex-cop had supplied the Tanfolio and Brown and 9mm pistols used to kill Danso and then Officer Dunn. Now a year later, Gary Nelson was driving in South London when a builder known as Gary Kuehl was driving behind him. Gary Kuehl grew impatient as he followed Nelson's BMW, which slowed down at every junction. The pair exchanged obscene gestures, but the builder became nervous when he saw a girl passenger in Nelson's car reach into the footwell and hand him something. Nelson got out of the car and fired five times at the van, hitting the bonnet and radiator. 
Mr. Kyo said I thought it was getting a bit silly, so I decided to turn right. Then I leaned out of the window and pointed his right arm at me. I heard cracking noise and I ducked down behind the dashboard. I felt fuds of bullet hitting the van. From the rate of fire, I would have said it was an automatic weapon. Mr. Kyo added I was very shaken. The court heard how earlier another man escaped injury when Nelson allegedly shot him in the nightclub and the bullet hit the zip on the pouch he was wearing around his neck, ricocheting off. William Boyce, prosecuting, told the court that in June 1993, Nelson had fired shots at Mohammed Masakoi in the street after an argument over a woman. The pair next met at SW1 Club when Nelson walked up to him and said, Remember me? I'm the guy that was buzzing shots at you before pulling a pistol from his waistband and opening fire, hitting him in the legs, thigh and buttocks. Mr. Masakoi gave evidence at Nelson's trial but was in custody awaiting trial himself on the charge of attempted murder. He was later found dead in prison soon after. It really seemed like the gun was a solution to every problem Nelson had, however little. Gary Nelson was sentenced to 8 years at the Old Bailey for the van shooting. Only 10 days into his sentence at Belmarsh High Security Jail in South East London, Nelson attacked prison officers and had 6 months added to his term. He was released in 1999. Nelson would then change his surroundings and travel to America, the land of the Second Amendment which gives citizens the right to bear arms. After a month long surveillance operation, Conducting in February 2003, Nelson was followed to the United States where he bought a laser device for a 9mm Browning semi-automatic. Police subsequently swooped on his flight in Woolwich, seizing the weapon and the device described as being designed to make the gun a more efficient killing machine. So even when he was overseas, he was always thinking of ways to become more deadly. In January 2004, he was jailed for life for possessing weapons and ammunition for a second weapon, following pressure from the victim's families and previous evidence re-examined while in prison, Nelson was again charged with the Clapper murders. Among the evidence against him was the discovery of the murder weapon in Wandsworth Cemetery, South London in June 1994, wrapped in a plastic bag with Nelson's mother's fingerprint on it. Jurors were also told that there was no way he could have failed to realise PC Dunn was a policeman as he was in full uniform and wearing a yellow reflective top. Judge Mr Justice Wilkie said each of them was unarmed and shot to death for no reason other than they were doing their jobs. Nelson's utter disregard for any civilised behaviour is reflected in the fact they were so pleased by what they had done they were heard by a number of witnesses laughing. These killings were as callous as they were brutal and senseless. Nelson gave no evidence during the five week trial nor was he in court to hear the jury return a unanimous verdict. The judge described it as moral cowardice. On the 22nd of February 2006, Nelson was sentenced to two life terms running concurrently with a recommendation he served a minimum of 35 years. I'm absolutely ecstatic, we have been waiting 12 and a half years, it has really been an enormous weight which has been lifted from our shoulders. Ivan Dunn, the officer's brother said, unlike his brother Steve, a pastor who had forgiven Nelson for the killing, Ivan said he would hate him forever. Former Met officer Mike Panett and now author of Rural Crime in North Yorkshire details the activities of Nelson in a book. He writes, he was the most dangerous man in London and had taken on the mantle left by the Yardies. Nelson was king and to be king you had to terrorise so no one would doubt the lengths to which you were prepared to go. This goes in line with what Detective Chief Inspector Steve Richardson who led the investigation said about Nelson. He is undoubtedly one of the most dangerous men in the country and it's to be hoped he is never released. Mr Panett told the Evening Standard I have no doubt Gary Nelson was responsible for more killings, but no one would speak. He had a hold over the community. I would say he was responsible for three to four other murders. He also described how detectives found guns used in PC Dunn murder buried in Wandsworth Cemetery after an informant signposted the way with lipstick crosses on tombstones. Now that concludes the story of Gary Nelson aka Tyson. A lot of you who watch these videos aren't subscribed, so please subscribe as it goes a long way.
like and comment too